It's with really great pleasure um, that I introduce Colin Neufeld um, of the Winnipeg firm 5468796. I never get past five numbers. I worked my way from three to five. I haven't mastered all eight of them. Um, uh, they uh, are a Winnipeg-based firm that have had a truly astounding uh, trajectory um, in less than uh, seven years. So they were established in 2007, um, and they unite um, 12 young professionals um, that are literally work around a single table. If you go on their website, there's a beautiful aerial photo of the collective work table uh, around which they all work. Um, and the firm has done a kind of amazing range of works. They've done um, some beautiful uh, installation pieces in um, uh, in Winnipeg in uh, the the Cube project. They've done some remarkable housing projects, um, some of which they actually self-generated, some uh, which they developed with clients. And and I think Colin will be talking about that today. Um, their work has been recognized with just about every award you can possibly win in Canada and internationally. Um, sometimes they've won them multiple times over. Uh, they've won a Governor General's Medal um, for their Block 10 project. Uh, they've won a Progressive Architecture Award for the Bond Tower um, and for BEGBX. Um, they've won uh, an Architectural Record Future Projects Award. They've won the RAIC Emerging Firms Award. They've won Canadian Architect Awards of Excellence. They just won the Future Projects of the World Award um, for an unbuilt project um, that they, I'm, Colin may be showing. Um, and they also, um, I think the other remarkable thing about them is they are both um, a truly outstanding design firm, but also amazing advocates for architecture. So they um, were actually the curators of the 2012 Venice Biennale um, and really instigated, I think, a kind of transformation in how the Biennale works in Canada, at least, which is that it's not only about mounting the exhibition in Venice, but also having it travel uh, either before or after. I, I, you left us a very difficult legacy to follow, I have to say, of making this thing now travel everywhere. Um, but I do think it was a, a kind of important acknowledgement that um, these kinds of events are also about creating a discourse nationally. Um, and they recently hosted a, 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 a truly mind-blowing event, which was called A Table for 1400. When I first read about this, I had this thought of like, this can't... I, this can't be right, but of course, as always, they've proven me wrong. And they indeed hosted a dinner t party for 1400 uh, on, the, on a bridge in Winnipeg. Um, and that was really about kind of generating a conversation about architecture in the city. And I think um, many people would say they've radically transformed the whole discourse, certainly in Winnipeg. Um, and um, I think form really a, a remarkable role model for architects um, in the country about uh, taking agency, about rethinking the role of architecture, um, about advocacy, and a whole host of other things. Before I turn it over to Colin, um, I wanted to say two or three things. One thing I didn't say this morning and I uh, would like to say now is um, I want to thank Donna, who may or may not be here, but she is uh, largely responsible for organizing all of this, the lunches, the speakers, logistics, um, helping plan the day, planning the networking cafe. And so as always, she's done a remarkable job. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors for the day's events, um, the REIC and the OAA, um, uh, who is represented here today by Bill. Um, and, I, and he's asked me to make um, an announcement, uh, which is that, um, and I didn't know this, and so you probably don't know this, um, that Students are eligible to register uh, free of charge with the OAA as interns. Um, and so I highly urge you to do this. It's a, as sorry? As students. As students, yes. Um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of having access to online resources and probably events, and also kind of moving towards eventually uh, getting registered. So I suspect there's information on the website. Um, you can grab Bill at the end if you have further questions. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colin. Thank you so much for being here tonight. 
Thanks, Lola. The, those words, I don't know, they always sort of make me smile in a way of, like, really? That's the practice that we're part of or we, we sort of get to be a part of? And the, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to work there um, with my partners, Sasha Radulovich and Johanna Herme, and our whole crew. Um, we're all sort of U of M grads and just sort of just sort of doing it we're not there's not sort of any magic to it it's just get together and work hard or work harder than than other people or than you sort of thought you thought you could so the uh we're having fun doing it it's a huge honor to be here um we spoke here a few years ago um i think all three of us were here at the time and that may i have memories of that lecture that Maybe this will be better. Maybe it'll be worse. The uh, but the it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be part of this a part of this day, this paths to practice. Um, I was saying to to uh, some people that I ran into, our school, uh, University of Manitoba, uh, the connection to the to the um, to the industry and to the practice or field of practice and beyond uh, is. Um, we're trying to find that voice, and when we come to places like like Waterloo and and others, we're uh, I'm encouraged to see how strong the connection is, and and sort of encouraged to bring that back to Manitoba. So, the uh, you should be commended for this day, and thank you for having us. Um, I'm been fighting a cold all week, so I'm going to keep this hopefully a bit light and moving pretty quick, so that we uh, so that I don't sort of fade off into my fever or whatever. I've got going, um, and so I was intrigued by the, by the the notion paths to practice and like what was our path to practice um, even. So we'll sort of start there and, and work through it. And um, when we when we talk about our our practice, so just as a as a side note, um, Sasha and Johanna sort of started. Not sort of. They started the firm, uh, and I joined them about five months into it. And they had sort of gone from two people working out of a out of uh, Sasha's apartment at the time, or his condominium, to there was ten people, and they needed uh, help, and they needed uh, to sort of to sort of treat this in a more um, serious or aggressive manner than, than they had sort of hoped in the first year. So that's where I sort of come in. I, I get into it sort of right at the beginning, although it, even the first five months of, of the firm had a fairly steep trajectory. I, one other note, to me this is such a cool day because you got to hear from, from uh, firms and practices and, and practitioners who are not just practicing traditional built form uh, architecture, but all this sort of um, the amazing skills that, that designers are given at, at um, universities like this to to sort of touch the world in a variety of ways. Um, so we're seeing right now, and I'm not the expert in this, but um, such a diversification in the field, right, of traditional practices and then what sort of all get lumped together into non-traditional practices by by uh, by architects or trained architects. Anyway, um, now I can't see anybody. That's good. The uh, so, but we would we would definitely say that that we fall on the the traditional side of things, even if our our outcome or our our projects are not traditional. Um, but maybe, and this is traditional plus, like with a little bit of a twist, um, because the the uh, traditional trajectories. These are yeah, sort of meant to give you a little laugh, maybe. Is like the traditional ways of starting an office are, yeah, you're an intern. There's many of you. Or you could put co-op up there. Hopefully, we don't sort of abuse co-op uh, interns in the same way. But you know, you sort of go from intern to to a, an associate. You know, you get to work directly with a, a real architect. Um, but and to, for the hopes that that someday you might make might make partner, and really we all hope to become an icon uh, <laughs> someday. No one ever says it, but really, that's the hope to be smoking a <laughs> smoking a cigar someday, uh, and not sort of giving a crap what anybody thinks. Uh, so anyway, that's one way. Um, there's the less popular way of sort of just. 
become an associate and then steal a client and on you go. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. The, uh, we started to see uh, other ways of, uh, these are things honestly, not the stealing a client, sorry, but these are things that sort of went through our mind uh, when you're gonna start a practice. And so I remember talking to Sasha and Johanna, we're sort of, uh, we went through university at the same time, so we, we had conversations even when we, when we weren't sort of thinking about starting a firm and, you know, could you, could you win a competition? Um, and sure you could, but it seems um, like, a, like a very specific way of starting a practice and one that if you actually really want to start a practice, might not be the most sustained or the most uh, effective way of actually starting one if you don't win one. Um, they're very expensive to sort of to enter. So then if you don't do the sort of take over a, a firm way, you sort of start your own thing, right? You hang your shingle and you hope to get a basement renovation uh, as your first client or, and you sort of imagine that you could probably get this client, but how will you get the next one? And these are the thoughts, I don't know if they go through your mind, and, but they really did actually go through our go through our mind, you know, you said basement reno, then maybe a strip mall. And this is the, actually the, the mode that, that we sort of tackled um, was, okay, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna go for it. Winnipeg must be ready for something um, called 5468796. Um, and could it be something? Like, could it, could it find its way into a traditional mode of practice and yet uh, sort of cross those traditional boundaries and and really challenge the city, challenge the locale, challenge the the really um, conservative context that it's in. Um, that is our actual sign. Welcome to Winnipeg. Um, that's I, it's shocking. <laughs> the this is what it looks like. Uh, not yet. Um, but for you know six months of the year, it's it's pretty snowed under, and we sort of call it a beautiful beige city. It um, had its heyday, <coughs> uh, sort of in the the 50s and 60s, and was quite a was a booming city. I think it was the third largest city in the country at the time, and its trajectory was sort of um, was was to stay in that direction. And then it just it just stopped. And uh, now I think it, well, I don't know the stats, but it'd be eighth or ninth or, or tenth largest in the in the country. And uh, and it sort of stayed at, at six, seven hundred thousand people for a long time. Um, and with, with that stopping, any sort of vertical development or innovative development really, um, it, it really stalled uh, sort of through the 80s, 90s and into, into the 2000s, and it was um, most grads were leaving um, were leaving Winnipeg uh, to practice elsewhere, Vancouver, Toronto, etc. And it was a it was a place that that um, the common belief was you couldn't design here, um, that you couldn't actually nobody would build anything interesting, nobody did anything, and this is sort of the a map of our downtown and the projects that we've been. Um, associated with, and uh, it's exciting to us. It's exciting to me, um, even if, even in those five months where I wasn't part of Five Four Six, to that Sasha and Johanna, uh, uh, being from former Yugoslavia and Finland, sort of why Winnipeg? Like, really, you're gonna this is where you're gonna set up shop to change the world, and yet, why not Winnipeg? I guess was is the easiest thing to say, but but why not? And what we do there ha uh, can have an impact. It's very difficult to impact you know, a city the size of, of Toronto, but in Winnipeg, everyone knows our projects. Everyone sort of feels them, touches them. They all make it into the newspapers, et cetera. And it's not a vanity thing, but it's a, it's a thing that where you, when you design uh, for a community, you want it to impact that community. And it really felt like Winnipeg was a place that we could impact. And we've been sort of blessed with with a number of projects all focused around the downtown core and we uh, feel that we've had an impact on Winnipeg. Um, we have, uh, for good or for ill, we are sort of fairly, um, we seem to be a polarizing object. Uh, typically, how do I do that? 
around that polarizing object. Uh, if you know the stage, the uh, Anyways, that's a different story. I don't even think I'm talking about it today. But people hate that thing. Uh, and people love it. So that's the sort of best case scenario. Um, honestly, that, that is best case scenario. For us, uh, Lola mentioned this already. Um, so we're going to set ourselves up in this sort of traditional uh, to practice architecture, to build architecture. Um, but maybe it has to be in a non-traditional way. And you know, all the the idea of that the idea is paramount, not the person, not my last name or someone else's last name, or um, not sole authorship. Uh, these kind of um, notions, we wanted to sort of do away with them. And the office structure is very sort of nondescript. It's um, a single table. It's about 50 feet long right now, and. Uh, we recently moved it. That's, I don't know why that just went through my mind. We got flooded out and we had to transfer the whole table to another location. That was a, it made us rethink the 50 foot table. Uh, but we really do work around this sort of single table. This is kind of what it looks like on a daily basis. Um, but if we're going to practice here, how do you not let it get stale? Uh, is a really important question, a question that we asked ourselves right from the beginning. And, and I think that's the traditional plus. Um, just an aside, these are my four kids. I have to put a picture in all the time. Uh, so that you know I'm not sort of as old as her. Uh, it lends me some credibility. Um, and that's my deal I made with them, that if I go away, I'll, I have to show a picture of them. Uh, but to not let it get stale, um, we we sort of said even it it has to, we have to be engaged in in other in other avenues, and so teaching is one of them. Uh, we teach a, a studio every year at the University of Manitoba. Last year we we taught at the University of Toronto. Um, we try to teach it sort of from a practice based perspective, um, which is different for University of Manitoba. I think there is a University of Manitoba graduate or undergraduate? Ed, did anyone go there? Nobody in the room tonight. Cool. Um, that is different for, then I can say whatever I want. Um, but it is different for University of Manitoba to, to really bring that practice, um, the thought of practice forward. But for us, that should not water down the, the concept or the, the, the theoretical bent of it uh, in any way. We tried to, this last time we, we sort of took everybody's projects and we said we're going to present it in a, in a coffee shop. So we took over this coffee shop for a day. Um, and these people here are actually, yep, they're just coffee. Like they were just buying the uh, coffee and they ended up staying for an hour and a half and sort of listening to the discussion and uh, sort of engaging and, and crossing some of those lines of, of everything stays isolated, like your office. Um, we're, we're sort of notoriously, as architects, um, protective of our ideas and, and of, of what we're working on. It. And we, we really want to, any boundary that doesn't exist for a reason, we, 546 really tries to sort of just get rid of it, if at all possible. And um, that, well, anyway. Um, that's the, we do that so that design doesn't stay some sort of notion of the elite or, or notion of people who can afford it, but really that it, design is for everybody. Um, research and advocacy is a, is a, was supposed to be and, and has been a part of, of the office ever since. Um, I think it's important to say that, that um, I think you probably even saw practices and, and Lola has a, a practice that the, you can set up uh, a practice around this. Our practice is still set up around the practice of, of built architecture, knowing that um, these things, we do them for their, uh, for their worth in and of themselves, but also to inform our built work. Um, that is a, a real, we, we just sort of desperately believe that these, these other things that surround architecture and the greater architectural discussion uh, should and can and, and really strengthen your built, your built work. Um, so that was a picture of, of Venice. I think there's more of that in a, 
in 2012 when we did it. This is a an amazing thing that everybody should should watch for and enter. And I don't. I ask often for sort of hands if anybody has heard of the warming huts competition in Winnipeg. Uh, if you haven't, you should be encouraged to sort of submit to it. It's uh, the forks, uh, which was that picture at the beginning of all the snow, um, is a, our sort of most public place in Winnipeg. And they host this competition every year to design a hut on our ice trail to, to warm you. And you're supposed to team up with a, an artist and an architect to, to create these things. And I don't have more images of them, but it, it's also uh, Winnipeg is finally embracing its sort of cold side and saying, what if we could be a tourist destination in February? Um, and our, we have this sort of three, four, five kilometer long skating trail that's scattered with these architectural gems every 200 meters. And it, it really is, uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And you should enter the competition if you, if you can. Um, <coughs> uh, this T for 12 is a, a research piece that we did that I won't get into, but it was sort of uh, looking at the math and the, the sort of economics of housing developments. Um, this we just did one day. Uh, we put four chairs outside and called it a called it a installation, and they sort of stayed there then for a month. And we these, none of these people knew we'd always we have a back door. We'd send someone out to take a picture of them if if they were sitting in the chairs, and uh, the we put design magazines out, and it's amazing like this dude here, he's reading a design magazine and uh, it was uh, it was a really fun sort of uh, way of engaging the city just in a really light kind of way. Um, this is uh, just a little plug I guess for, for Storefront Manitoba. The uh, It's a advocacy group that's sort of been established to, uh, and I told Bill that we didn't have one. Um, but and I was wrong, and I was forgetting this. But it has such a loose connection um, to the MAA that it really does feel like a grassroots thing that was sort of started by by architects uh, who just care about architecture, and it's not about promoting our firms or our names. And and so, and in a short time, it's it's really done a lot of done a lot of things, um, and is supporting the design community. So, this the it started with uh, where is it? Uh, on the board, so the first thing there. Um, this is something that it would be amazing to see, and I don't. We don't know if it exists in other cities, or, but we sort of challenged architectural practices to do to to sort of take off the cloak and and put whatever's on the boards in your office up for your peers to see it before it actually gets built. And the uh, it's amazing the resistance to that idea of showing your work before it gets built, even though you're going to build it, and forever the whole world's going to see it. Um, but it, it's gaining momentum and uh, really engages some, from some really unique discussions. And uh, that is something that we're, we're really sort of passionate about, about that on the boards and, and how to make ourselves as architects more accountable to each other and, and to raise the level collectively. Um, Lola, you, you mentioned uh, this and how it sort of changed the, the how Venice was approached. Um, like we took uh, when we uh, won the writer, were selected to to uh, be the representative for Canada at the Venice Biennale. We we I think were selected based on the idea that it wouldn't be about about um, us necessarily, but it would be about sort of bringing uh, Canada's design culture to to Venice, and and also sort of s starting that dialogue of of uh, between architects and designers across the country. And while this is a really great slide, and and man, it was hard. The uh, and so I, while it maybe did change the bar a little, I wouldn't recommend it. The uh, it was we did we hosted competitions in every province across the across the country, um, assembled a jury for for every one of those uh, competitions, 
uh, hosted, um, hosted, sorry, what is it? Uh, these are some of the winners um, of those competitions. And then we hosted events like this in every city, not every city, but in those cities that were just shown across the, across the country until it all sort of left. Um, we did a national uh, exhibit then at the, in Winnipeg, at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and then took the winners selected there from a national jury uh, across, to, uh, across to Venice. And the, selfishly, the part in Canada was uh, more impactful than the than the part in Venice to to me personally and to the to the sort of the the discussions that were able and Venice is amazing um, and I think it should be on everybody's radar and everybody should go to the Venice Biennale as many times as they can um, I think you just can't get that kind of level of thought and and. Uh, uh, sort of passion in one spot very easily, but the national exposure of it and the national discussion was really critical to us um, and then it did sort of end up in in Venice. I think this is the last sort of advocacy part that I wanted to to mention um, we did we were selected for the for the uh, practice pre to Rome this last year or well, we did it starting last fall. Um, and the idea there was uh, you'll sense a theme, like we've got these table for 12s, table for 1200s, table for, um, well, we are in our office is a sort of a table for 12. And we, we yes, it's sort of convenient, uh, but also we really do believe in, this, in the idea of the table and what happens uh, that you can't plan and you can't program and you can't sort of, um, uh, sort of dictate or, or prescribe when you get people together and actually meet face to face and you're not just submitting um, briefs to each other or written work and so we had this notion of, of making 12 or 7 dinners across uh, across the world with hopes of sort of diagnosing or at least coming up with some ideas what makes these uh, design cultures tick and how did it how did that happen and the uh, the to sort of bring this back to practice the as I said this isn't um, this is a research project but it really is to inform our practice and then hopefully to inform the practice of architecture in in Canada would be the would be the hope um, we had incredible dinners with incredible guests uh, and the discussions were were more than than you could have hoped for and we sort of wrote about them all and and blogged about them all and what's unique is that every one of these cultures it was from a different from a for a different reason why that culture exists or why they were able to sort of accomplish what they accomplished I have never um, I was in uh, Lisbon in in Portugal and the the uh, high regard that CISA is held in is is unbelievable and the fact that they are not um, they're not shy that they have an architectural hero. They promote him. All the we did not find an architect who didn't sort of love Caesar and and believe that that what he was doing or what he's done for architecture in Portugal was the only reason or one of the paramount reasons that 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 it, Port, Portuguese architecture is on the map. And the so that's that was one uh, investment in Copenhagen. Uh, this sort of critical debate that's only possible in New York City. Uh, in Sydney, there's a political champion for architecture right now. And, and we just came back from this invigorated and not saying, well, what one of these should we bring to Canada? But, but what is Canada's, like, what, is, what could be our um, moment that sort of marks Canada's uh, place in the architectural discussion? And we just get so excited about that, about how watching Canada's voice rise and and who who can be that voice and and how do we uh, how do we find that sort of mechanism so the, it ended with this uh, table for for 1200 at the architecture festival this is the bridge you sort of see people on it um, it's a 1200 foot long table and that was continuous and Johanna comes up with these ideas or comes up with these ideas and we just sort of laugh at her and say, oh, that's not going to happen. 
And same response that you had, Lola. But we know Johanna enough now that it probably she probably actually means it. And we're actually going to be hosting dinner for 1,200 people. None of these 1,200 people knew where dinner was until an hour and a half before uh, the dinner. The table didn't exist. The, it all got set up in the last uh, hour and a half to two hours before the, before the dinner. And it was such a, we got blessed. Uh, in Winnipeg, getting a perfect night for an outdoor dinner is fairly rare, um, but we just, we got a perfect night. And it was such a, a great experience to be part of 150 tables is what these were all linked together. And we had uh, designers and graphic designers and musicians and, and uh, advertising agencies and all, anyone who would call themselves creative or a creative industry, we tapped them on the shoulder and said, would you design a table centerpiece and design your table and host a table? And we had all 150 tables hosted by different, uh, by different groups. And you just watched people. And then Winnipeg, this beige city that doesn't care about design, sold this, this dinner out in a day. Every ticket was sold. And they came. They, they wanted to be part of of design and sort of touch design and feel design and it it's just not true that people don't want it it's it's just it, it that's sort of um, what we found anyway so it's just not and we should be doing this and this is would be sort of an encouragement I, I hopefully to to everybody to sort of keep pushing um, next year we might charge a few more dollars for those tickets so that we didn't sort of bankroll it, but uh, the, that sort of is the end of that advocacy research, um, sort of keeping ourselves from getting stale, uh, doing, just doing built work with your head down all the time. Um, but I did want to take a, a few minutes to, to sort of talk about some of the, some of the, the projects that we've done and, and and what we've found in terms of how to instigate those projects. Um, because the, when, when we sort of set out to, to plan the office and, okay, we'll do a basement renovation um, as the beginning of it, that's not terribly fulfilling. And even, uh, even in the larger budget projects, we found very quickly that there isn't, um, there's no room for architecture uh, in these projects and in Winnipeg sort of beat it down kind of pricing and, and such. So we realized quickly that um, how projects are made and how they're conceived is going to have to be different if we actually want to uh, produce critical architecture that can, that can garner a response um, like this stage here. Um, these are a few that, that we've sort of uh, come across, and I'll just use a, an example on each of them to sort of show you how we've instigated or conceived and, and sort of made projects come into, into being. So as simple as create the project, um, make it, have it be your project where you are part of the invest, investing team or you're part of the development team. Um, looking for unseen potentials, uh, we'll show you that in a second. Find the money has been um, one, really, if there's one of these that, that we sort of use over and over again is take a typical project that the client walks in with and then say, okay, but there's no room in that budget to do anything. So what if we just park that budget and the profit that you want to make on this job? And if we can make you more money, can we spend some of that on architecture? Or if we can change your pro forma to lower your uh, operating costs, can we spend some of that money on architecture? And they all say yes. It's important to ask the question before you show them how. Um, because they all say yes, if you can make me more money, you can spend some of it on architecture. But if you make them more money before you ask the question, they just want it. They're developers. Um, so that's a, I'll show you sort of what that meant to us. Um, you won't know unless you ask. We sort of look for, for uncovered potentials. Being connected, that's part of that whole research and advocacy and, and uh, uh, doing things like this. You have to be connected to, to the community and to the broader community. You can't, in our minds, um, and you can't be afraid to sort of try harder 
and to keep trying if it if you haven't found uh, if you haven't found the right solution yet, you need to just keep working at it. Um, so, because our sort of path to practice was about was about um, practice, the we have and. The, to get institutional work, to get any sort of big budget work in Winnipeg is almost impossible, especially for a startup. So we would get clients who walk in, like notorious clients. We've had them all in Winnipeg, like from biker gang members to we, terrible sites that don't even look like sites when they show it. We're like, that's not a project. You can't build anything on that piece of dirt. Um, we have all of these guys sort of walk in. Um, this guy, I won't tell you his name, but he uh, was, he's very notorious, he sort of chews through architects. And uh, he showed up, he's like, could you design me something on this back parcel on this um, uh, large, large project, or on this large parcel. There's like an 11 story building here, and then he recently bought this back parcel and wanted, he said, could I build uh, 60 units on there? And the uh, sure you could, but then we looked at it, and the first thing we did when we went to the to the site was we saw this front of the site that has this uh, beautiful grove of trees in it, and this and this lawn, and said, "What if you built also on that front parcel?" And he's like, "Well, I, I don't think I can. Like it's always been there. It, it is what it is." And so we started looking into it, and you can build on it, and it ended up being. A parcel that would hold 44 units and so we took this guy and we we said okay if you wanted 60 if we can give you a hundred you know uh, where where does that leave you and he's like leaves me very happy um, and so the he was willing and plus it, it uh, this project being a would would it be a smaller project was a project that he could engage and do right away and uh, so we sort of dove into this. This back project would have been waiting, still waiting, I think actually this next month it's getting its approvals for proceeding. But in the meantime, we've designed uh, and brought through to, to the start of construction this, this front parcel. And what we find is when we, when we um, show clients how design actually works and that it um, can impact your bottom line, not just take away from your bottom line, uh, they start to become believers and they, they start to give you more leeway with the aesthetics and with the, the actual expression of the architecture. So that um, so we were going to work on this front parcel. I won't talk too long about this, but then it has that grove of trees and uh, these this group of people got really upset with the thought of us building in front. Uh, so then we said, well, first we showed them a big bar in front of them. Uh, and then we said, well, what if we sort of cracked it and and uh, can do this? And and then we further separated and we kept that grove of trees and we built a designed a whole sort of scheme around uh, saving that saving those trees, but providing these 44 units on the front parcel that he never imagined. And what it did for him was he. This is how he's branding himself now. Uh, he had this tired 1970s you know, beige building, and now he's branding that whole development based on uh, what the new street presence is, is gonna be. Um, I'll talk quickly here about two projects that we had a hand in in uh, creating. The, we had a client walk in who we've done other projects with, uh, Green Seed Development. Uh, it's a, a developer that we've, that we've made a really strong connection with. If you know Ucube, uh, that project was done with him first. And he sort of came to us and said, okay, I, I have this site, but I really want to build something simple. I want you to do it because we have a relationship, but I don't really want architecture. I just want a white box. And the, you get, well, we said, well, then we're not terribly interested. So we said, what if we're investors? Then you have to build architecture. And he, he said, but I'm still building it, so it has to still stay true to that white box mentality. And we've shown this project a few times, so I won't uh, talk about it too long, but um, creating the project has certainly been a way for us to, to bring our voice to it. And the poor guy, his white box got a bit messed up, 
and uh, we sort of twisted all these all these units on top of themselves, but yet uh, really kept it simple. Uh, all the core, everything goes through the core in terms of its uh, uh, utilities, and then it just has empty space around it. And then what we were really um, uh, intrigued by was this sort of um, periphery that could be inhabited, this sort of uh, zone that, that was neither inside nor outside, and it would be sort of enveloped or framed by the by the screen. And this is an example of, of how that six-foot zone sort of ends up being um, uh, realized. And this is Hollywood Squares. The uh, the marketing for this was funny. Everybody asked the same question, so you would start answering it before they asked it. Really, I have eight neighbors. Um, because of how these things all twist together, you end up with, I think the minimum is eight neighbors. And everyone freaks out. They're like, well, that can't, that can't be. I'll, like, you'll just go crazy. And yet, we, so, we sort of spun it to them and said, well, if one's being, no if you have a noisy neighbor, and you only have one, you can't get away from that person anywhere in that place. But if you have a noisy one, you can just go upstairs and you have a new neighbor uh, who's not being noisy that day. So anyway, it seemed to work. Uh, all of these units end up touching a corner, and the, uh, that ended up being a huge marketing uh, ploy for them, that they could sell every unit as a corner, as a corner unit. Um, and this is... You know, after all of that, after sort of finding the way in, you sort of try to make it make it architecture. Um, this is this is an example of a project that hasn't been built yet. Um, but we we engaged it. We bought this uh, little lot, this sort of forgotten lot in uh, just on the edge of of downtown Winnipeg, and uh, it looks like this right now. Um, and it's actually just this. <laughs> it's not even both of these. And we've, uh, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. The, uh, but we proposed, um, oh, and James Bond comes from Winnipeg, which is pretty cool. Uh, the inspiration for James Bond is William Stevenson. So that's why it's called the Bond Tower. Um, the, uh, so we have this really sort of skinny strip of land that no one's ever going to develop, no one's ever going to sort of do uh, anything with in, in Winnipeg. And we said, we think you can do something with it, and, but we're going to have to push it like crazy. So we went and asked the city, um, uh, like, first fill the site, but we asked them if we could cantilever over the sidewalks. Um, and they said, okay, but it has to be a certain height, and you have to pay some nominal fee of like $300 a year or something. Um, and then... Uh, but because it has sort of no windows, because of how tight it is, uh, we knew we had to sort of crack it open a little bit. So we we uh, cut openings through it and are hoping that that, that gives, uh, typically an office tower has no uh, uh, engagement with the exterior. And we're hoping that it does uh, because of these uh, apertures through it and how they frame uh, various views. And we imagine fairly, uh, hopefully, amazing outdoor spaces that, uh, you know, on the 12th floor of this building, you can uh, you can go outside for your coffee rather than uh, just the staff lunchroom, and frame some some uh, of Winnipeg's views. You could just see the Human Rights Museum sort of poking out there. Um, and then. Uh, it becomes sort of how we do things, but we, we created this marketing uh, package. Sorry, oops, can I go back? Uh, created this marketing package that showed how the building could be inhabited, and you could buy one floor or two floors or all 12 floors, and how we would actually change the, the configuration of it um, to work. And uh, so that's a project that we have initiated uh, right from the beginning in terms of site purchase and investing our fees and and it's a maybe a small point but it, it sort of bears mentioning um, investing our fees into a project is a, a, a extremely effective way of investing into a project um, because of what percentage they represent to the overall project is we all know what it is it's it's six seven eight percent whatever it is but to the initial capital expenditure which is 
how investments are sort of, uh, uh, what's the word, um, viewed or, or calculated, it represents a much greater percentage of the initial capital investment into a project. So you can, uh, A, um, find a way, it's a way to, to potentially make more money as a practice that you can then do, do better work, but also um, a way to influence design, because if you are the most significant investor at the beginning of a project, it's amazing how much say you get uh, into a project. What did I call this one? Trying harder. The, uh, when all else fails, uh, just try hard. Um, this, this project was amazing. We tried it so many different ways. The client desperately wanted 25 units on this site. Um, they, we showed them it doesn't fit because they wanted uh, them to be built only as three-story walk-ups. Well, this is what fits on the site like it's wall to wall back to back like it it doesn't it doesn't work and they every time we would show them 19 units or 18 units they just kept saying it has to be 25 so uh, it was a very interesting relationship for a while um, finally we fit 25 on and somehow uh, we we fit them into this is the the footprint of that building not this and um, we we went to uh, we sort of had to look elsewhere for for our uh, guidelines or for what would be sort of an acceptable amount of space to live in. Um, we didn't want to push it beyond livability, so we just, instead of using um, like our North American standards, we used European graphic standards uh, to tell us how big bedrooms and, and master bedrooms and such could be. And we found that the smallest dimension that, that sort of worked in at least one direction was eight feet or 2.4 meters. And so we designed everything around that around that module, and then we knew that some spaces would need a, a larger, so that's the master bedroom and the living room uh, sort of project beyond that, uh, beyond that, that eight foot mode, or that eight foot module. And so then, and you'll see these pictures of, of, the, of it furnished. Um, because nobody believed us that you could actually do this even until it was built, uh, even after it was built. They're like, ah. So we furnished it. We went and we bought all the furniture. It's for a uh, low-income neighborhood and, and for sort of uh, subsidized housing. And so we said, we'll buy the furniture for one of these units and we'll furnish it and to show you and then we'll will how about you select somebody who can have that furnished suite if they don't have their furniture themselves and so that was um, just always proving the concept always proving uh, always sort of putting our money where our mouth is I guess uh, if you will and it um, well it is a, a tight place the site does sort of remain uh, livable it's got two courtyards that that sort of people look down onto and uh, the community has embraced it and, and sort of uses it fairly, um, fairly aggressively. It is a, a low-income neighborhood, but it, uh, uh, we think it's, it's fairly successful. I think I just have one more. Okay. Um, then the uh, sort of in terms of how to make projects, uh, this is the project that I'm talking about, Green Seed. Uh, Mark Penner from Greenseed always sort of seems to show up uh, in our office with a site that nobody else wants, uh, and he's been able to get it for free, remarkably. The, uh, nobody else wanted it. The, uh, there's a reason why it was free. Um, so he, uh, U-Cube was a, was a project that we did from, then we did Block 10, and he sort of keeps tackling um, harder and harder sites. Um, so this one, you can't really see it, but this is Winnipeg's only freeway. I know you laugh, but we have one. Uh, and it's about six blocks long, and uh, it's actually called free, uh, Freeway. But it, so that's the site. The site is right at the bottom of, the, of a retaining wall for this freeway. And, and it's parked behind uh, a U-Cube. This is um, the, our U-Cube project that is eventually going to, or it's done now, but it's, it's gotten built all the way to this edge. And then this is a, uh, there's a giant billboard here actually. And then sort of parked back here is, is this piece of gravel. 
And uh, he's like, well, could we build something on it? And he'd already taken title and like, it wasn't a question, it was what can we build on this, on this thing. So we looked at it and we said, well, you really shouldn't build anything at ground level. Um, you, you likely should build it up. And if you get up, actually it's, it's fairly, uh, fairly amazing. And so the, uh, I think I, I sort of titled this one, Not to be Afraid. So Not to be Afraid of a Bad, uh, of a bad Project Type or a Bad uh, Site or a Bad Client. Don't be afraid of them. Just embrace it and go find what's, what's there. And this ultimately was the only um, solution that he could actually sell to, uh, to investors or to, to condo owners. And yet it immediately makes the potential for an iconic building by, by lifting a, a condo development on stilts. The, the sort of problem with it is it gets really close to high rise measures and he couldn't uh, afford to get into high rise measures. So we ended up with two floors of condominiums and somehow we've convinced the city that this is just a really tall floor. Uh, so it's a three-story walk-up. <laughs> and it's, it's awesome. It's wood framed the, because, it's, because it's a three-story walk-up. They, they are frustrated because they could not find a reason to not call it that. And the, uh, we gave in, like we sprinklered it and stuff because it isn't a three-story walk-up. But um, it had to be wood framed. It had to not be a high-rise it, in order to hit these performers. And so it has a very tight budget on a really lousy site. And yet if you sort of uh, work it enough, uh, we just really do believe that you can find a solution. Uh, that being said, it requires a client who's willing to to also then embrace the solution because the solution to problems like that are often uh, fairly unconventional. Um, so this is a boring slide about how we ended up at the donut. Uh, one of the things that happened early on though was we went to the site, you walk around the site, there's nothing that is sort of engaging about it. But so then we said, well, maybe there is something about uh, about this site. So we rented a, a scissor lift with the, with the contractor, drove it out there, and, and just three of us went up on the scissor lift to sort of plus 45 and took these panoramas. And you're, in summer, it's, a, it's, it's just treetops that you see and the rivers in the distance. And as you go around, you get Winnipeg skyline. And it totally changes the site. The site goes from one of the worst in the city to one of the best in the city because of it's just a little bit uh, away from downtown. It has uh, uninterrupted sort of views of downtown and our amazing huge sky, et cetera. And so um, it is breaking ground next week, which is, which is pretty exciting. Um, and I'll leave you with one comment that this is, architectural sort of renderings can get you in trouble because uh, this wouldn't make you believe that it's a bad site. Um, and so we hired a landscape architect who believes strongly that, and she's amazing, and believes strongly that we can actually plant this, this site and make it into something. Um, but we just recently heard um, from a few jury members for things that, that uh, from competitions and awards that this has been submitted to, it never wins. And they said they got to, this last one. Just said we got to this, and didn't understand why you were lifting it off the ground if you have a site like that. And <laughs> it it's a really important message, like because it is a bad site, and yet the. Uh, when you actually submit these things to, to competitions, etc., they only can look at them for so and so long and, and di uh, sort of engage them in, in so much way, in so, such a detailed manner, right? So that is uh, sort of a funny thing. This is a sort of it from our uh, from our freeway, and the uh, the articles in the newspaper are always the the uh, spaceship has landed or is landing or. Uh, what have you. Uh, I'll just go quickly through this one. I thought I was done. The, the, this is the last project, I promise. The, uh, this one is, is fairly, uh, sorry, manically going back and forth. Um, 
This is again a great site, like you know, great buildings next to you, um, and the uh, the the guy came with his project and and for uh, to lease it to our health organization, and uh, but he didn't actually have enough building area to um, to provide the 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 building program that they needed, and we said, well, what do you you don't have enough building to actually provide um, what they need, and. So I think we said you don't know unless you ask. So this is the first time that we asked the city if we could hang out over the sidewalk. And so we hung the exit stairs around the edge of the building, um, out over the sidewalk, and that captured um, more usable square footage inside the, uh, inside the building's envelope and so that we could actually meet the client's program. And... Uh, Interestingly, we always, when you find the, the move that sort of you need to make a project, it ultimately becomes what defines the project and, and it becomes a non-negotiable. Um, it's not the canopy that, or the, that you're hoping makes the project great um, that always gets cut at the end um, because the client runs out of money. He ha this is his exit stair, so you can't cut it. Um, and this is kind of what it ended, not kind of, this is what it ended up uh, being. And uh, built on, a, again, a very tight budget, um, but the client ended up being sort of very happy with it. And, and they got a building that, that uh, for Winnipeg is, is fairly cutting edge. And those staircases, actually, we believe, and we should do a post-occupancy on it, um, should become... Um, because they're all continuous stairs now, they're not switchback stairs, they're not sort of locked in a windowless place. They're actually, they have windows, they're wide and continuous, and we believe that they should be getting used uh, as communicating stairs. The uh, um, Avenue building, this one, I'll just do this slide and then I'll, you'll see a few pictures. Um, this client was sort of, notoriously conservative, didn't want to build anything. And so we showed them that we thought he should take his heritage building and hang some boxes off the edge of it. And uh, he's like, you're ridiculous. <laughs> the, uh, so he's like, just paint the building. And we said, we can't. It, the, the building that you'll see is, is too important in Winnipeg uh, for it to just be painted. And also, though, he, has, he had no money. So we said, in terms of, we didn't, what if we could generate money for your building upgrade? And so the, uh, we said, if these boxes could become balconies, then who would pay more? And he's like, nobody will pay more for an apartment with a balcony versus not. We said, that's not true. So we went and did a poll and found out that people would pay up to whatever this is, somewhere between $25 and, and $40 a month, they'd be willing to pay extra for a balcony. And so we used that to generate, we said, so now we're not asking for anything. We just want to be the access to spend that money on your, on your project. And he's like, okay, go for it. And, but you only have $7,500 per box to, to hang off of this building. And we, he did it. Um, I don't, should not say we did it. This is the builder. This, he became such a fan of this and was so excited about it that he um, actually, the day that all of these went in, he just shut the site down for the afternoon, went and bought a few cases of beer, and, and he just let everybody just take the afternoon off and, and sort of uh, be in this sort of urban uh, space. This is right on Portage Avenue, our primary street, and a block from Portage and Maine. And, it's such an urban experience to stand out on those, on those balconies. And then um, this is kind of the, I guess, the statement that they, that they make to the city. Now let's see if I have another project. No? Cool. Um, just the last couple slides uh, on the, uh, something that, that this, is, this is fairly dry, but I, it's fairly dear to our hearts, actually. Um, after all of this, um, so the practice can work, we can make critical architecture, we can be engaged in a broader discussion. We, we, we've sort of gotten to that level of we can do all of those things and, and that's great, but can we actually make some money 
uh, is sort of a question we asked ourselves a few years ago. It's sustainable, but but surely we can apply some of this innovative thinking to to business. And I, I know that's not exactly the paths to practice. I keep looking down at this, by the way. Um, it's not exactly paths to practice, but I think it, it is in a way that if you're going to establish a practice, then yeah, why should we bring innovation just to our clients? We can bring it, we should bring it to, to everything. And so, we, uh, Johanna, again, this is Johanna's idea, um, and all of her ideas sort of end up working, which can be frustrating. Uh, the, uh, so she came to us with, with this, uh, the idea of an incentive program, and this is whatever, you can get all of these in professional practice and whatever, but she wanted to come up with an incentive program that would allow the whole office to benefit from it if we made money this year, like more than we made last year, and we would agree on the amount, then uh, everybody gets a piece of it, and which is great. It's sort of like what we do to our clients. If I can make you more money, can I spend half of it on architecture? And so if we can make more money as 546, sure, we'll give uh, a, a chunk of it away to, to everybody because everybody's involved. And so then how do you actually make more money? And so the, the, the thing that we always sort of default to is increasing revenue, and that's an important part, but the, there's a slide coming up that I think is, is really important to note. You increase your revenue, you only, that doesn't actually make you more money, it just makes more uh, net uh, money or net profit, but the percentage stays the same. Uh, unless you get more efficient, and the uh, so you, it's not the most effective way to grow your profit to share with somebody in terms of a percentage-based cutting expenses and increasing efficiency turned out to be sort of far better. Or oh, we asked, maybe everyone just takes a pay cut, and then at the end we can share your pay cuts with everybody. That didn't go over. Uh, the that's option two there. Anyways, the, uh, this again, if we can find 10% savings, we can actually fund the incentive program, whereas to fund the $100,000 incentive program by increasing revenue, we have to increase the revenue by $800,000 to get that same $100,000 in to share with people. Um, to do this um, requires something that apparently is uncommon, but we're just completely financially transparent with everybody in the office, and we s sort of established the budget, showed everything to everybody, and this is the the slide that I'm talking about. To to get that same hundred thousand dollars in profit, you have to increase here by a million, or just save yourself. I guess in the end here, it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in reduction in expenses. Uh, is how that's made, and. Again, I told you it was dry, uh, but the, it wasn't dry to the office because collectively we worked hard at this for the year with this sort of, there was a carrot at the end of the year and we all worked at it, all cutting expenses. The office manager found, I think, $60,000 in office expenses that she just saved. We're like, that's great. Why, why were we spending that? But anyway, she just she just found it. But and our overtime went from uh, off the charts to I think we spent seven thousand dollars last year in overtime, which is remarkably low for twelve people. We had three sick days last year um, out of twelve people total, and so everybody bought in, and we ultimately made it. And I think uh, I think. So have one last slide of Sasha. Um, sort of, there's always a way uh, to to figure something out and to to be innovative where where you uh, to be innovative to not just default to standard mod model of practice or standard model of of client relations or a standard model of of what an office should look like. So um, I think that's that's where I'll leave it.